enter the matrix. That pen is going to work now. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Enter, exit the matrix. Let's try that again. Yeah, that's better. So you know about this concept called the matrix, right? It's it's our presence, it's our future, it's we are basically large capacity batteries and we are um, overwhelmed by machines. And we see code, we live in infrastructure, we are infrastructure. And we have this one last bastion. Um, oh, oh. We have this one last bastion called Zion, and it is under constant attack. And we are fighting against what we call the squids. That's the danger coming from the outside. Large beasts ramping up on the city of Zion, the gates. And we also have the danger from the inside. Agent Smith, Mr. Anderson. Right. Cool role by, by the guy who played uh, an elf too. <laughs> Go figure. Um, but the thing is, we have these defenses in place. We have the Nebuchadnezzar flying around looking for more people, but we also have these large mechs defending the city of Zion and the last epic battle uh, in, in uh, into the Mate. In, um, what was the last one again? Uh, darn it, forget the name. Well, anyway, they fight off and they have the last stand and they really defend themselves. But in the end, there's only one thing that can really save them, and that's Neo. And this is what this original session was about. You becoming Neo. Because Neo is security, and Neo is omnipresent, and Neo can defend whatever there is in the Matrix. So, because we want to avoid this, right? System failure means imminent death. It's uh, game over, come again, no coins inserts, right? So that brings us to this session. It's all about security, all the aspects that are in Azure as security, which is a lot, you will see. Uh, but first, let me introduce somebody else who can also really kind of make an idiot out of himself. <laughs> And why am I not hearing you? Oh, damn it. Oh, no, 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 no. There goes the. Wait, 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 wait. It's here somewhere. Ah, uh, oh, no, that thing is still playing. That's what you get. That's what you get. Me and technology, it doesn't work. All right. Kill off Spotify. Here we go. So let's try that again. I, I ruined your intro, mate. Sorry. Anyway. Let's try that again. So the guy in the back, but you're not, we're, <laughs> we just had to do this. <laughs> so every single time you see me now at a conference, we're going to do that. So if you're ever ramping up as a speaker, be aware. <laughs> this was really fun. So, uh, and actually it's all his fault. <laughs> Give a hand for my co-speaker and my presenter today, Rick Hepburn. Okay, so we, we've agreed that we need to adjust Mike's medication levels. Um, so, so as, as Carl was saying, um, unfortunately Alex Mang, who's a good friend of ours, is unwell. Yeah. So uh, we were talking in the bar last night about how we can um, add some value. Um, and, and, and Mike and I have a habit of doing sort of more conversational sessions. So Mike's got a really great security deck here. Um, which he's going to attempt to try and talk about, and I'm going to attempt to ask questions and interrupt, and hopefully you guys are going to ask questions and interrupt as well, so we can try and get a whole load of value. Um, I am going to try and be the voice of the audience, because I realize you're all quiet. <laughs> so I'm going to be loud for you. Um, if there are questions you think I should be asking that I'm not, chip in. If there are topics you want to go deeper into, chip in. Yeah. We are standing between you and lunch, so if we overrun, it's your fault, right? Just so we get that one clear at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> nice we'll one. see where we go from there. <laughs> nice one. So we have about, let's say, a small uh, lunch is when? Uh, 11.30, right? So we have about 40 minutes for, for doing that. So I don't want to overdo it this time. Okay. So first, I have a question for you guys. If I say security in Azure, 
what's the first thing that pops to mind? Or what do you think security is? Any takers? Oh, <laughs> straight really? to identity. Really? Okay. Oh, all right, all right. Anybody else feeling up with him? Least privilege. Least privilege, yeah. Virtual networks. Virtual networks, okay. All right, so, yeah, so. Anybody who's not a speaker want to chip in at this point? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So, real Finnish people. <laughs> Come on, guys. Yeah. Physical security, yeah. Ooh, Ooh, I like nice him. One. But he's wearing an Azure t-shirt. He must be a pro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Actually, you're right. Security in Azure can be found on these 15 spots. It's not only AD. That's the, that's the one thing that I dislike when I go ask, what, what do you, where do you see security in Azure? They all go, I AD. No. No, there's more to that. There's more to that. So we have these 15 core topics that we can discuss. Um, I'm am go gonna jump in one which I find really important uh, because it always starts with something else uh, besides these. And uh, I don't know whether you've ever seen this, but this actually is uh, an adapted uh, version of the of the truth. So I talked about the matrix. So this is a little bit of a red thread. Normally, if I do this talk, it would take up to four hours. Don't worry, I won't. <laughs> I don't have a piece of paper going out. But if you, if you want to touch every single piece of security, you need at least four hours. Yeah? But if you talk about security, you first start off with the matrix, the internet, and everything which is surrounding it and uh, interacting with it. And then we have the physical defenses. And who was it again? Raise your hand again. The physical defenses What you, right? So yes, we have. Excuse me. We have physical defenses. We have the sharks with freaking lasers. And the only one that can do something about it is Batman. Why? Because he has, bat, he has shark repellent bat spray. For those who have seen the 1966 movie. Yes, I'm that old. All right. I know it. Uh, no, I'm actually, I'm a fan. And then we have the edge defenses, which we provide for you. We do a lot out of the box for you guys that you don't see. We provide you with things like DDoS, we provide you with multi-tenancy schemes, we provide you with segregations, we provide you with pillows where you can sit on, just to give you some thought. Really? Azure pillows? I'm up for that. I'm totally up for Azure pillows. Really? Yeah. <laughs> It's fluffy, it's cloudy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense. And then we have your defenses. This is the things that you need to take in place, that you need to put in place. And we can even do a whiteboarding. That, oh, that brings me to a hell of a great idea. Let's do, let's try to be more interactive. So they have to do the thinking and I just have to be silent for once. We could totally draw this in one note as we go. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, it's really interesting, Mike, because you're looking outside in. Yeah. And Rob was obviously thinking inside out. Yeah, inside, yeah, he's, he's thinking um, inside. Yeah, yeah um, but um, both of those points of view are important. Yeah, yeah. Right? But they're both valid and important. Because the one thing that always keeps getting forgotten, that was a wrong sentence or a strange phrase, is your application and your code. This is the one starting point where you need to chip in. And you need to invest in that. Yeah? And um, in the end, eventually, you want to make sure that you also become a cool guy, nice sunglasses, you can buy them anywhere, but and the bullet thing, don't try that at home. He's a trained professional. Don't do that. But you, you live in hope, right? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, but the one thing that I really want to give away is this thing. Um, application deployment starts with safe application development. And I know you, are, you guys are IT pros, but you can help here. There's a lot of things that you can help with your developers that, they can, uh, that you can enforce them to do. First of all, make sure that you work against a security development lifecycle. Get them trained on security. Let them know what DNS is. Let them know what IP spoofing is. Let them know about OWASP. Let them know about all these things. And that's both beneficial for you guys and for developers. So, so there, are, there are things that can help you with that? Yeah. Um, the, the, um, audience participation time. So how many of you guys are using um, the product formerly known as Visual Studio Team Services that is now Azure DevOps? Okay, cool. So uh, f did you know, for example, as part of your build pipeline and your release pipeline, you can run something called CredScanner, yeah. which will look for 
um, things that look like storage keys or passwords or secrets, and it'll fail the build if they're in there. So you can go and take the large stick of correction to the dev that included them. You can also run, and, and, and we run, something called the OWASP dependency check, yeah. which is a free tool that will look at all of the libraries you're using and all of the libraries those libraries are using and notify you if, you, if, there, if there are vulnerabilities in there. So you can start to look at your code and the things that you're using for known you issues. You can even make it even more cool and more better because there's this free software called SonarCube mm -hmm. and they have hookins for the OWASP rules. They do. But they also have hookins for uh, straight security injection code and uh, all these vulnerabilities that they check on. But, and they also check on refactoring and on uh, technical depth. So that's additional value because you need to make sure that you get rid of all that bad code. And it rides back to Visual Studio, uh, to Azure DevOps. Darn it. Anybody already using SonarCube? Nobody? Ooh, right. So, so your mission, Jim, is to go and, so the SonarCube and Sonar Cloud. <laughs> Um, go and have a look at it. So you all run FX Cop, Style Cop, right? You're all, yeah. you're all looking at the quality of your code. So SonarCube does a similar kind of thing, but it does it over time. So it shows you whether you're accruing technical debt or whether your, your code is improving. And unlike Style Cop, FX Cop, it publishes no, those it uses, rules down. It actually uses them. It does, but if you just so just using those tools, you've got to make sure you copy all the rules around. SonarCube publishes them to yeah, all the devs exactly. involved in the project. So exactly. it's a really great and tool. It's good that you talk about that cred scan thing because it's it's a plugin that you can also download for Visual Studio. It's the uh, what's it called again? Uh, CICD. Uh, just no, it's it's called the Visual Studio uh, Continuous Development Integration something something. I have the link in my deck, so you will get the full deck. There's more slides than we can talk about, but if you look at that solution, I. And you gave me a great time because I forgot to open my Visual Studio. So by the time you were done, uh, my Visual Studio was open. And if I now can see where my mouse is, where's my mouse? Where is the mouse? Where is the mouse? Here is the mouse. No, it's not. Oh, gee. All right. Come on. Really? There we Tell you guys about the mouse? Because I can't see the code window. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm, I'm trying to wait. Let me fix that for you. Oh, darn it. You have to love multi screening. Uh, so here we go. Put this out of the way. Put this out of the way. Put this out of the way. And this is all we need. But, and now it's minimized again. Ah, oh, darn it. Why you keep doing that? All right. Here we go. So what this grid scan does, it actually looks for. Um, credentials, key, appreciate keys, or whatever kind of uh, intelligent looking uh, passwords, and it gives you green squiggly lines. Now, green squiggly lines, normally you say, oh, it's only a warning. That's true, but you can actually, if you do gated check-ins, you can make sure that it fails on that. And as you can see here, what it does, it's actually, it gives you a warning and it says, well, the thing that you're doing here, validate and rotate and move them into uh, uh, in this case, you move them into, yeah, it's not moving. You move them into Key Vault, those secrets, which is the best practice. Now, if you're doing .NET Core, for instance, there's a NuGet package that automatically generates a key gen for you and a Key Vault, a vault for you. So it costs you only like two minutes of time to, to download and install the VSIX implement it at least on your Visual Studio so that way you know that you're implementing a bad practice. Doing the, it like this, and imagine that you're doing this with storage keys. A couple of years ago, this bookshelf, this bookstore from, from Seattle, had an issue with a lot of storage accounts where people um, uh, that put in their code into GitHub, they forgot to take out their storage keys. And by means of that, they could find a hack to generate VMs and do Bitcoin mining on their behalf. So you all of a sudden get a credit uh, invoice saying, hey, you've been spending like 13,000 hours on the highest level SKU VM. Go wild. Here's your, uh, your invoice, sir. And then you yeah, probably get a heart attack or you just start looking like him. That. So <laughs> I, I know what you're thinking because you, you're all IT pros, right? In fact, we, have, we haven't done that. How, how many people think of themselves as IT pros in this audience? Okay. Everybody, how many people think of themselves as developers, right? And how many people don't like raising their hands when an Englishman asks you? <laughs> okay. All right. So, Fair I mean, the, the, the thing is, 
um, one of the guys that works with, with me, who's a, a real PowerShell guy, says, look, um, you might think of yourself as an IT pro, but you write PowerShell scripts, right? You check those into version control, right? Yeah, well, yeah. that's development, really? So it's the same practices. And also, when I go and talk to customers, when we're, we're talking about cloud adoption, it's a mixed audience in the room. The IT pros are there because they're the guys who are concerned about network security and compliance with all of those existing policies. And it's like, how are we going to adopt the cloud? And the devs are there because they're the shock troops, right? It's new. It's this cloud thing. The devs are the first through the door because they've got to experiment and play with the new toys and see what they can do. And somewhere between those two camps is balance because Microsoft really greased that developer on-ramp so you can right-click, publish, and do all kinds of stuff. And the IT pros are going, stop. Um, so if you, the IT pro audience, understand the tools you need to get the devs to use to do this properly and you can start them on that journey responsibly, that's good. Yeah. And if you, the devs in the audience, understand the pain of the IT pros and why we keep telling you about this stuff, then that's good and we get sort of harmony, right? We get some value there. There's one more tool that I really like you to learn to, to use. And this is one where, uh, Carl, where are you? Ah, it's called the Azure Security DevOps Kit. This that's thing. what I was trying Sick to about. And this, now as it, it's the old link, I know. Um, but it will be out anyway. It's a full set of tools that we, Microsoft, have been using for a couple of years now to do our own DevOps style. And what we do here is we check our code, but we also check our JSON templates for false givens, things we configured or misconfigured. You can implement that in Azure DevOps as a plugin, which checks your deployment, checks your resource groups, does a check on your ARM templates, and you can even just let it go in your environment and it generates you a full list of Excel with all the things you're doing bad. And at first you feel really bad because you go, whoa, did I do, did I do that? It's like a dog that, you know, that when wandering in the house, you need to rub it in. But once you get it rubbed in, you don't do that again and you learn from it. Use this tool. I think calls talk is somewhere online. If you're in Belgium this weekend, you will be talking about that again, or is it not that talk you're doing? I, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It's now. <laughs> so it's now. Uh, so that's, but at least look at it. Yes, I knew it was on record somewhere. So Carl did a great job doing that same talk in, uh, in, in Orlando at Ignite. And it's really worth of implementing that. If you implement it with the other tools that we've been mentioning, you, your code will be a safer world. Now, one more tool that I'm gonna give you and then we're gonna start asking questions is, did anybody hear about the step before this, before you start writing code? What's the first thing you need to do? Is model, model your threads. Also for that, we have a tool called Threat Modeling Tool. It's free, you can download it. But the cool thing is, the, it's an open source uh, template that you have behind it. And the cool thing is that it has a Azure template. Now this is for a uh, IoT uh, environment. It's still there. And the, the thing is, you grab your flow of your application. You don't grab the, the direct links, but you grab the interactions that your application has with components. And what you have here is, if you draw your, uh, your, your um, solution and all the interactions that you have, this is for an IoT white paper that Microsoft wrote a couple of years ago. Uh, this one is actually produced by Clemens and by Dan. Um, what you have here is if you look at the, um, the view, you can actually have an analysis view. And this is where the fun starts in because you actually, it generates you a checklist with all the things that you should be aware of, whether it's in, uh, in personalization, whether it's SQL injection, elevation of privileges, these are all the things that you need to keep in mind. The Azure template that we have, which comes out of the box if you start off a new one, uh, has specific components for SQL, for Cosmos DB, and all these things. And you can just start creating your, uh, your uh, solution by modeling it by means of the stripe method. Uh, that's all as documentation here in this slide. So I don't know whether they will distribute it elsewhere. I'll put it on the OneDrive and you can download it from our OneDrive. 
What? So we were going to start outside in, but actually you, you've, you've kind <laughs> of already kicked us off on, yeah. on inside out. So, um, all right. So we started with secure your code, develop your app, architect your app. You touched on Key Vault. That's the next thing, isn't it? Get rid of all of your secrets. Don't include them in code. Don't include them in config anywhere. How many, how many of you guys are already using Key Vault for storing all of your secrets? Use nice, okay. good, and, big tick. Okay, question again. How many of you are using Key Vault in the correct way? <laughs> so there's two ways you can use Key Vault, either in the good way or in the less good way. I'm not saying that it is a bad way, but there is one thing that you need to keep in mind when you're doing keying, and that is key rotation. If you, always, if you put your key into a vault, but you always keep this key the same, what's the use, right? So if you use a key vault, there's this easy way of storing your keys from a storage account or whatever. Um, and especially with a storage account, in the PowerShell way, you can have a, a additional parameter saying rotate keys and it will rotate it on a given time for you, which is pretty easy. Yeah? How many times do we, do we need to rotate, rotate a key? It depends on what you're using. It's the magic, the magic phrase, right? It depends. We are, we are in IT, we are exact science, but we always say it depends. Situations are imminent. Um, but if you're doing key vault, at least make sure that you rotate your keys at least once a week, at least. But you need to think about the key vault concept also from another aspect, it's not only about security, it's also on a given of cost. Because with designing Azure infrastructure, you also need to keep in mind cost. Yeah? So in comes a new aspect called cost-driven architecture or CDA. It's nothing to do with uh, the developer, cloud developer advocates from Microsoft. No, cost-driven architecture is actually, it's actually a term made up by Martin Balio, by the way. He came up with that term. It's his fault. Yeah, it's his fault, all is his fault, uh, even the singing. But uh, if because every single time you rotate the key, it will cost you like a buck or three. Yeah. So be wise when rotating keys. So don't go rotating keys every single time you want to recreate your SAS token because that won't work. It will work, especially for my bank accounts. <laughs> All right. So keep that in mind. So, okay. So moving on from that one then, um, you've got all your secrets in Key Vault, right? Brilliant. Um, but you need to secure those keys so only the right things can access the keys they need, which starts to move towards what Rob was talking about with Azure AD, because what that means is everything that we deploy in the cloud really should have a unique identity that we can use to manage its access to stuff. So there's two different ways we can do that in the cloud now, isn't there, Mike? We can use managed service identities and we can use service principles. principles yes. So as you write your code that you're deploying in app services, you should be running as well, I would usually run stuff as a service principle. Um, when you're deploying things like virtual machines, that kind of stuff, you can give them a managed service identity, yeah. which means they can access secrets. Look, look at them as service accounts in a, in a Windows machine. Actually, it's basically that, but with a little bit more privilege outside of VM. Yeah. Basically, that's it. So all of this starts to come into your compliance requirements that by doing all of this, you can document and say, well, we have this key vault, we have these secrets, we have these access policies for these secrets and these identities and these identities map to these processes. And your compliance guys wander in and read that document and go, tick. Yeah, that's indeed one of those things that um, can come out of it. Then you've got to go, well, okay, well, how do we prove what's going on? Enter stage left, auditing, and Azure Monitor. Yeah, and this brings us to uh, the holistic view. Can you raise your hand again? That was you, right? Yeah. So the holistic view brings us to two things, actually. It brings us to Azure Monitor, where you can have all the auditing and logging availability, either by means of Monitor itself or by means of OMS or log analytics. I keep saying OMS. Why did they have to change the name? Even the team call it OMS. It's, yeah, right. it's a thing. Or you can do it through another uh, tool that we give and that we enable for free on your environment we call Security Center. Who today is not using Security Center? You're all using Security Center. Uh, at least somebody is not afraid to admit it. Okay, why aren't you using it? Uh, 
It's not an excuse. Do we, Carl, can we get a car? We're going to do a karaoke with him. <laughs> That's your punishment. You're a developer. That's not an excuse. Because even as a developer, you can benefit from it. Remember the thing we talked about just a couple of minutes ago, that uh, AZ SecOps kit, right? Yeah? Which checks your templates and stuff. It will be injected in there in, in time. They announced it when they announced the new site and it will be an injection in there. And that will come from your DevOps street. And your DevOps street is mainly your fault for your responsibility. Because you inject the code, you create the code. Even for past services, we use Security Center a lot. And there's a lot of things that we can say about Security Center. And we've ma Microsoft made a lot of effort on, in improving it and in making it uh, prettier and, 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 and all these things. And it works seamless also with other services without knowing it. It gets all its info from, from the log analytics, but also from uh, application insights. There's some in intake in there. There's basically information everywhere. Why is it showing like this? I didn't click anything. So just while he's trying to make his portal work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you said you were a developer. Are you using Application Insights? Yeah. Because again, telemetry ties yeah. into our security model as well, doesn't it? You Indeed. need to emit stuff that you can look at. App Insights will, will do that great job of modeling your application for you and show you what services it's talking to. Indeed. And that's some, it's, it, it's the links and uh, with the new givens that we have now in uh, the VMs, we have this new service map injected in immediately inside of VMs where we can monitor our interactions with, uh, with uh, other services. We had that since the beginning also in uh, Application Insights. We call that the uh, service map, uh, the application map. As you can see, all the interactions that are going on. Even injections can show up in here. So there's more to it than meets the eye. Now, if we look at the security center itself, bringing us from the developer back to the IT Pro a little bit more, we have a lot of coverage in there. We talk about policies, we talk about uh, scoring, which is a new thing we have since uh, two weeks, uh, which is a security score. And this, again, is a wall of shame because all the components to itself will make an extended score and it shows you how well you score against your end target. And if you look at it, and it gives you immediately interactions on what should we improve first. And this is a little bit comparable with what we have in SonarCube. It's our technical depth or the failure not to comply with the compliance rules that we set up. And this is again where you as a developer also have a responsibility because if you do code which has injections, it will show up here. If you do code that has cross-site scripting, it will show up here. Yes, it will. <laughs> I see him looking like, ah! because we set compliance rules and the triggers that are on there will generate alerts and you will actually see that. So you, you mentioned policies there, Mike. Let's, let's just dwell for a second on policies and bounce around a bit. So um, one of the, the biggest conversations I have with organizations is where is our data? This Azure thing is fantastic. And we let the dev team loose and suddenly we find that all of our accounting information is in West Virginia. And that's not quite where we want it to be because we're based in Europe. Storm, perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> so um, policies are one of the most important things that you can start to apply to your subscriptions because they give you basic rules that you can rely on. And a policy can either block something or it can audit something. So you can say, um, if somebody is trying to deploy to a region that is not West Europe or North Europe, then block it. Um, if somebody tries to deploy a resource without tags, because maybe you want to use tags to identify what project something for, something's for, for, for auditing, that kind of stuff, you can block it. Yeah. Blueprints block. then build on that because blueprints allow us to say, okay, um, pause, rewind a sec. So you come across, any of you guys come across management groups? So management groups are, are, are a way of building a hierarchy that matches up to your Azure AD tenant and allows you to sort of map your organization if you like. So you can, you can have divisions, you can have different countries, you can have different teams and build a structure. You can then attach Azure subscriptions to that hierarchy and using that hierarchy, you can then staple blueprints to subscriptions. And what a blueprint allows you to do is to, to define effectively a rule set. So, so you can it's say, right, yeah, I have a template for my developer subscriptions. 
that's going to automatically grant access to my developer teams, that's going to automatically apply a set of policies that says they cannot deploy outside West Europe or something like that, um, that's going to automatically create a key vault in the subscription for the devs to use. I apply that blueprint to a management group and any subscription in that management group has the blueprint applied and all of those, those standard rules ripple down and out really easily. And again, I get full auditing and I get reporting on what's been applied to what subscription so I can then report and say, hey, we're compliant. And I can version control those blueprints and I can update those blueprints. And um, we can do clever things like if I apply a blueprint to an existing subscription, I can go, if there is no key vault, deploy one. Um, so that's really useful. And that's, can that's use, I mean, you can use them again in our DevOps strategy to See, check before we deploy even something. So that way you comply against the policies before you start deploying. So no, no harm done before, you know, uh, what, what do they call it again? In, in, in Dutch we have a saying, the put dimpel voor het kalle verdronken is. How do you say that in English? I can't say that in don't Dutch. Shoot, don't, don't sell the skin of the bear before you shoot it, something like that. So, yeah, it's, it's also one. Exactly, thank you. Thank you for that, because I, I was in a jolly spy, you know, the <laughs> yeah, packages yeah, left yeah, yeah. the building. We, we have a, we have, we have a <laughs> Express Route Direct, and it's, a, it's a thing. <laughs> crazy, great minds or crazy minds think alike. So, no. All right, uh, so, so we've, we talked about identity, we talked about policies. Now that thing's touching on some of the outside in stuff we were talking about, yeah. because you were talking about things like SQL injection, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What if I've got an application? Can I deploy something that will help protect me from those type of attacks, no. even if I haven't quite done it myself? We have, we have a couple of things for that. We have, first of all, we have, of course, our application, uh, web application firewall, which does all the top 10 OWASP checks. So it, it, it actually uh, does a little bit of um, uh, package inspection and, and, and communication inspection, looks at the payload that's coming in or coming out and checks for those rules. So the top 10 rules, and you can easily just, uh, by means of a policy again, uh, chip them off, check them off or on, whether you want them implied or not. Um, and OWASP is a, is a, is a global standard. Uh, the top 10 in there are cross-site scripting. Let me show you, maybe I have a slide in there that can, yeah, here we are. Here we have it. So we have, um, nope. I need this thing out of the way, of course. Here. So we have um, uh, the uh, core rule set 3.0 and 2.29, which are two rule sets that you can have uh, out of the box. There's a full list uh, which can protect you from its injection, cross site scripting protocol violations, uh, rate limiting, so giving you troubling uh, things, scanner detection. Um, uh, um, session fixation, what's the LFI, RFI again? Uh, don't think of the abbreviation. Help? No? Okay. But, but this will actually help you on that part. It will not, however, help you against uh, things like uh, DDoS. We do that out of the box for you, and there's a lot of confusion there. And I'm switching gears here. No, that's, the, that's cool. The, so so the, there's two levels of DDoS protection yeah. in Azure. So um, before we move on to that, I just want to dwell on this for a okay. little bit. So, so application gateway is fantastic. When you deploy it, though, you have to deploy it into a virtual network because ultimately it's, it's deploying VMs. Yeah. And this is another one of those where it demands its own subnet. But what a lot of people don't realize is even though you deploy it to a virtual network, you can still put application gateway in front of app services. Because it's just an endpoint. Yeah. So you can still have your scalable PaaS service protected by WAF. And it will give you, like we just said, some protection against um, sort of URL detection and, 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 and how people are calling your app how many people are calling your app and whether they're bringing it down through sheer weight of traffic because you know the, the we like mike website is something you want to hear every day um that's yeah, where really? ddos protection comes in yeah. and as mike was saying that the, there are actually two levels of ddos protection in azure do you want to talk about yeah. that so we have basic and everybody thinks where do i find that switch well that's actually the thing that we do to protect the infrastructure and the services that we run day on daily basis so that's for our own endpoints and making sure that those endpoints stay alive. I, I think I have somewhere a slide on that that will make it more tangible. 
it's in the beginning of my day. So it's like we totally practiced this and everything. Man. Yeah, yeah. That, no, it's, 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 I, I told you, it's perfectly fine. Um, so this is actually the thing that I'm talking about. So what we do here is do, we do syn, uh, TCP sync flooding uh, detection. It's also uh, based upon um, some machine learning and there's, there's intelligence behind that. And what we try to do is we, uh, if there's at least a DDoS attack from on the service level, we try to reroute. Now, in come the standard version where you pay off, where you can have either uh, a mitigation sequence or you can have just a detection sequence and where you can just do the monitoring on top of that. What I like to see here is that if you do the mitigation part, I also like to see that into um, a combination with, uh, with a CDN. Why? Because for the high volumetric attacks, it's easier to offload it to the, to the CDN and then your services keep on running. Um, if you run today a CDN service like Akamai, you can actually extend the Akamai uh, CDN DOS floating onto that uh, subscription and you can use that one. And you don't even have to pay a lot more because it stays in the same subscription. Akamai has a deal with it. So it's very, very cool to see how that works. But don't go thinking that you need to flip the switch for the basic version because you already have that. But it's a well-known, publicly known secret. So basically that's, that's the thing. Just like we do antivirus and, and all these things on, 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 uh, on traffic. Okay, so now we're getting a bit deeper then. So we've protected our perimeter. Yeah. We've defended ourselves against DDoS attacks. What about managing traffic within my application? So um, let's start with, with IaaS because that's the easy one. So mm -hmm. we, we can deploy virtual networks, right? And I can build different subnets yep. and I can put different machines on different yep. subnets. And then we have our VLANing concepts. That's the one thing that people don't still don't get. If you talk to infrastructure guys, yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the time. Uh, if you talk ages, to yeah. yeah, ages, yeah. If you talk to infrastructure guys, there's one thing. There's always this one concept that comes back. We need VLANs. Well, you have them. We provide a couple of methods of doing VLANs. First of all, you have subnet segregation, and I know that's not a real VLAN. But if you combine those with NSGs on top of the subnet, you can actually segregate that fully subnets with force tunneling and with um, user-defined routing, you can actually segregate it as a full VLAN. So you have full control there. So, and, and I know where you're going, <laughs> you can even inject services inside of these subnets. There's no need to go from the inside to the outside and back again to address real pass services. For instance, that, that kind of was where I was going. I'm going to pause for a second. There. So um, personal preference. So a network security group allows you to define sort of firewall rules, basically. Th this address range Actually, inbound yeah. to this address range, this port allowed deny. You can staple a network security group to different things. You can staple it to a subnet. You can staple it to a, a VM. You can staple it to a, a, a VNet. For the sake of your sanity, unless you absolutely positively have to, for God's sake, don't staple them to VMs. Yeah. Use them as a subnet boundary. And if you're then concerned about your traffic, you can use user-defined routes to control how traffic gets from subnet to subnet. And if you want to force it through an appliance and scan that traffic, you can do that. Most of my customers that attach NSGs to VMs immediately start to struggle because they've no idea what rules are being applied or which NSGs they've applied to what, and, and that way madness lies. Um, Luckily, we have a solution for that. <laughs> so, segueing on though, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's great. So within my, my VNet, I've got complete control over traffic. But friends don't let friends do IaaS, right? Mm -hmm. We Thank want to you. take advantage of, of, of PaaS because we want the scalability, the flexibility, and let's face it, we want to use the buzzwords, and serverless is a buzzword and it's not on IaaS. So how can I manage the traffic between my PaaS services or between some of my virtual machines and my PaaS services? Because obviously that's a public Azure IP address, right? So can I restrict the traffic between, say, my app service and my SQL server? Yeah, you can, because of the integrations that we have on several layers. I mean, like for instance, if you're, for those who are running app services, there's now since uh, Ignite a new feature we already had in ASE. So everybody knows ASEs? So application service environments, the big expensive app services that you can run and scale out and whatever you have. And the, the one true meaning of using those real hardcore integration into your virtual network. 
But now, since uh, the latest release of the service, we can actually do that on an app service plan too with free net integration. We don't have to go through a VPN anymore. No, we don't. So um, there's, there's two parts to that. So one of the things that Mike was alluding to earlier was service endpoints. And service endpoints are really cool. So if you've got a, um, a PaaS service like Azure Storage or Azure SQL, what you can do is connect that PaaS service into a virtual network. Um, what basically ultimately under the hood gets created is an IP address on a subnet on your virtual network, which when you access it, routes you through to Azure SQL or Azure Storage. So firewall rules have been in SQL and storage for a while to limit what you can call that service from, which is great if you're calling it from a public IP, right? But if you're inside a VNet, the PaaS services don't know about your internal address range. They don't know about 10.1.1. whatever that my server Indeed. is. Service endpoints allow them to understand your internal networking. And you can then write the rule that says you don't respond to anything except traffic coming from this service endpoint. Plus it allows you to have a lower cost because you don't do the outside trip. If you do the outside trip, you always pay a little bit more, yep. even if you're doing on the outskirts, on the outskirts of Azure. Yep. So. so that was great for Storage, data, brilliant. But app services didn't really join that party. App services were still using a point-to-site VPN connection into the VNet to then gateway out through the service connection. And you can only have a hundred connections on point-to-site VPN and setting it up's a faff. Um, so what they've now done is, is, is this new service that um, Christina Compi. So you should absolutely uh, look for the session at Ignite by Christina Compi where she talks about all of this stuff. You can now fasten the PaaS app service into a VNet so you can securely route through from your app service to your SQL DB. But not only can you, can you do that, so, so Mike's on, on the public internet accessing my website, my website's talking to him, but to get the data from Rob, it's talking privately to Rob. We can flip that. So we can have a PaaS website which is only accessible from inside right, my yeah. VNet. So for organizations who are compliance sensitive where, and I know there are lots of you out there, where you, you build a VNet in the cloud, you, you either VPN or direct uh, express route that back. God, look at express route. <laughs> route is something that cuts wood. Um, connect that back securely to your on-prem and you only talk to your Azure services across that private link. Now you can have PaaS services that you can connect to securely across that private link that cannot be accessed through the internet without you having to cough up a lung to pay for app service environments. Oh, you still have lungs? Not anymore. <laughs> service environment. Okay. Okay, cool. No, all right. Uh, how far along are we? We still got nine minutes. Yeah. Um, so we talked about, uh, we talked about PaaS services. We talked about service endpoints. We talked about networking. We talked about VMs. What's missing? So, Closing the loop a little bit, back to Rob and his identity. Um, it's all very well that, that you know, I, I, can, I can use Azure AD to protect my website, so I sign it, right? Mm -hmm. um, what about right the way down to a granular data level? How can I protect maybe individual records in my SQL server oh, or individual yeah. blobs? Can I use Azure AD for that? Yes, you can. And you can also use um, like SQL users, you can have multiple uh, security layers in, in databases because it will not only be longer for SQL server, it will also be for the other databases that we now provide. MariaDB, which has been announced. We have uh, Postgres and MySQL, and all these services will get the same granular features that we are having on that platform. So what we're doing now, we started off with SQL server, which has a rich security set already. Uh, and when looking at all the components, it's really, uh, that can be a talk in its own for two hours, really. I, I kid you not. Um, so what you have is you have data masking, you have um, TDE, so um, transparent data encryption. Thank you. <laughs> Luckily you were looking at me because elsewhere I couldn't find it. You can have row level uh, encryption and row level security. So only having uh, rows to uh, certain people that are allowed to see them and you need to do some uh, SQL uh, magic on there because there's no real interface for that. Um, even the masking, it's it will be uh, only visible to those who have access with AD, for instance. You can now have a AAD uh, administrators on that with RBAC. You can fully in the SQL pass. I don't know for the managed instance, it's already in there, but I'm 
too sure about that. Um, but for coping with all that, we also have um, tools that can help us to identify risks and uh, identify um, threats. And that's also one thing that we have. Uh, it's a flip of the switch that you need, in my opinion, if you take security seriously, it's something you need to enable. It's called threat detection. It works on the same way of uh, discovering threats like we do with ATP. For those who don't know ATP, it's uh, Advanced Threat Protection for either Azure and Windows Defender because we have that in two flavors. Yeah. Uh, it's the same way we look at uh, threats from within Security Center and that will also come back to Security Center. Maybe it's not a bad time to give another sh uh, sh five uh, minute demo here. So if I go to my um, uh, SQL service and I need the other uh, portal because I need my own portal. It's here. Oh, it's, where is it? Come on. Here we, this one, this one, here we are. So if I go to my SQL servers, I actually have, come on, here we are. So SQL, yeah, SQL databases, I wanted SQL servers, well, I can jump up, it's okay. So what you do is you set these uh, uh, rules on top of the server and they will be pro um, propagated down uh, to the environment. One of the cool things that you can have here is that you can set actually alerts when people are from a region that you don't know uh, trying to access your databases uh, and it will actually generate alerts into the security center which can send you an SMS or uh, a mail and saying, hey, there's somebody's tampering around with your database or trying to get access to your database. First of all, we have a lot of protection when it comes down to uh, databases in either flavor because we have firewalls on server level, but did you know that we also have firewalls on database levels? So there's two of them and the one there's one that you can set in the portal and the other one you need to set to SQL code. So that's one thing that a lot of people tend to forget. Um, so looking at this advanced threat protection, it's just a flip of a switch and you need to make sure that you have um, your settings, some, some configuration done. Cool thing is it gives you some ad additional value too. Let me add some value there. Because if you are running today in a fully compliant environment and we're all European, so there's this one little thing that is sitting on our shoulder, it's called, yes. And the one, th the one buzzword we didn't want to touch, but we're going to touch anyway. SQL database can actually help you defining where your data is GDPR confidential and even compliant, yes or no. Because what you can do here is it, it, it generates a full report on and, and the data discoverability by means of cognitive services that we let go on your database. And we start looking for patterns, names, addresses in all the different languages that are supported. I don't know whether it's supported in Chinese. I don't know even SQL can, um, can like grasp Chinese column names, but probably can, I don't know. Uh, and I don't know whether it works with Finnish, but it works in most of the languages. And it actually generates a list, if you look at it. It will generate a list, here we go, on all of your data that you have in your database. identifying data which is personal or confidential whether it's bank accounts or something like that and it really generates and then you can classify it and it will generate your report and then you can show it hey, look here we have our, our PII uh, we already have that and then you just need to cope with with everything else and this is taking a long time so, so while that's taking a long yeah. time one of the things that I, I, I want to connect to that because there's something else I want to talk about before we finish in a second um, Mike was talking about that sort of threat detection and people connecting to your data from regions you don't want them to. Um, the great thing about using Azure AD as your identity plane is that Microsoft can detect types of attacks that you could never do if it was you on your own premises. So Microsoft can tell if somebody from the same IP address is poking different Azure AD tenants. And they can detect if lots of different IP addresses are poking the same 
no. Azure AD 10, and all kinds of different attacks. So they can start to alert you if known bad actors are trying to access your stuff in ways that you probably wouldn't be able to notice. And segueing on from that one, so it's great. We've got the single identity plane, um, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But what about... Um, I'm, I'm really paranoid. I need my Azure admins to do multi-factor auth. And what about just enough admin and just in time admin? Uh, can we do that so, as well? Yes, we can. And uh, especially for VMs, we have that feature now since more than a year in the security center. It's just a rule. And the cool thing is that it, it, it does create an on-the-fly access inside of a network security group. So if you open up a portal, and you go to security center, and I actually did that on my VMs because I don't want anybody to get in there. And the cool thing was, yesterday I opened it up and somebody from Bulgaria was trying to access my servers. Unless all the traffic from Finland is relative to Bulgaria, or were, no, it's, it wasn't you. <laughs> you were here, so it couldn't be you. Who do we know in Bulgaria that could do something like that? Uh, so anyway, um, so here you have the just-in-time VM access. And what it does, it generates on-the-fly NSG rules that you can allow for a certain time and a certain IP or IP range, and only for the ports that you demand. So if I just say I want this one, and I want to give it uh, request access, and you can automate these things. I mean, it's the same thing that we do as Microsoft support teams, because we also have something like that. We, if, for those who ever opened the support ticket, if you're wondering why it takes so long before you get actually somebody on the line, it's because of they have to go through uh, two layers of management, checking off whether they have, can have access to one of these machines and accessing your resources. It's not because we're lazy, no. And not because we have a lot of support tickets, but it's because of this, because of the structure of data security. So, so and as you can see here, we can just set the ports that you need. Uh, you set it on ARM, you can set a time range, and you're good to go. You can choose how long you want it. So that's really, it's, that's really helpful and really specific. Yeah. But what you might not know is you can basically do the same just-in-time admin yourself using Azure AD. Yeah. So if you enable the, the right features, what you can do is use RBAC. So you can say, this Azure AD group has rights to manage this SQL server. But then you can say, OK, well, Mike can be in the Azure AD group that has rights to manage the SQL server but he's not in it all the time. He has to request access, and when he requests access, somebody else in that Azure AD has to approve that access, and even then, it only puts him into that group for a set amount of time. Now, that's really useful when you combine that with something that Sam is gonna talk about, which is Azure Active Directory Domain Services, because then you can start to reach inside your infrastructure that's running inside your Azure VNet and use the same just-in-time admin. And look at that, we're about on time and we've touched almost all yeah, we've the high-level bits we've, of security. We've, we've touched a lot, so um, they can show one more thing. Go on then. So uh, one of the new features we, uh, that the security center guys um, opened up to was uh, this thing. Uh, it's pretty cool if you look at it, um, it's the networking um, aspect. So nowadays you can take a look at your environment and see where there is an impact on all the, oh, and I should use the other one because it has more data in it and then you actually can see the scale of that thing. And this is so cool because you can actually see all the interactions that your environments are having and whether they're on the attack yards or no. It's especially if, uh, from a networking perspective, but it gives you a very cool graphing if it's willing to load. Yeah, there we are. And you can immediately see where all your endpoints are at risk and where you have a, a real issue. That combined with the alerts and the investigation uh, capabilities of forensics that you have we can immediately identify where there's somebody, because that's how I know somebody from Bulgaria is trying to access my VMs, because it actually showed up in this, in this thing. So you can see all the group responses, you can see all the, uh, all the machines that are, if there's an, an exclamation mark, there's actually an issue there, and you need to look at why there is an issue. And it will give you all the traffic analysis, it will give you all the, uh, the interactions that it has. This is, for, for instance, for, uh, even for containers it works, so there's a lot of interaction there. Too. So I think hopefully what we've shown you in all of this is that 
Security is everywhere in Azure. It's everybody's responsibility. You need to start thinking about it right from when you, you start considering cloud adoption yeah. all the way through development, through production, into monitoring the whole sh shebang. shebang. And, and we, we can cover everything. Shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, we, we cover everything from outside in, you know, traditional firewalls and port management, antivirus, inside out with user security and all that kind of stuff. And all of the really useful modern approaches like just enough admin, just in time admin to help you do this. Um, if you've got any questions, we're not running away. We might, however, point you at people like Carl and Alexander and, and Rob for oh, look, more beer. specialist <laughs> solutions. Yeah. Um, but we, I think, are now between you and lunch, are we not, Carl? Yes. Carl's yeah. nodding. Food! So we tried to behave and try to keep on keep it on time. I think we, we managed it, so... You did quite well. I heard, uh, heard you say something about uh, you touched a lot of things, so... Behaving <laughs> it. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for your time. He's been Mike, I've been Rick. We're not going anywhere. Come and ask us questions. Okay, thank you.